Uh, good morning. We have a very short time for this presentation. It's only 30 minutes. So if you have questions, we can address those afterwards. Can you hear me at the back? OK. This is actually just sort of an overview of what is going on in the high pressure industry. We are going to be a little biased towards the beverage industry because there is so much people that are interested in that area. So a, a good significant part of the presentation will cover the, what is going on in the beverage. So we'll take a look at what high pressure processing is, how it works, and the growth in HPP usage. We'll also look at some of the market drivers for these categories of foods. And uh, also, we will end uh, with a presentation or a very short two minutes on the largest equipment that is being offered for HPP processing. Uh, Bureau Technologies have just introduced a 525-liter system. And we have some brochures at the back that you can collect on that system itself. So what is high pressure processing? It is the compression of a fluid. In this case, it's the compression of water. During this compression, we induce physical, chemical, and biological changes to microorganisms as well as food components. It is a non-thermal process that inactivates harmful microorganisms as well as spoilage bacteria without affecting the nutritional content of food nor affecting the flavor. And that is why it's so attractive currently for the beverage industry. It is a process that eliminates the need for preservatives. No one that is doing HPP is using any of the chemical preservatives in their foods. So you have a clean label. How it works? Food in their final package is loaded in a basket. And that basket is put into the HPP vessel. That vessel is then filled with water. Now, once the vessel is filled, we add additional water. In physics, the only way you can do that is to make the volume that is inside there smaller. So with high pressure, there is a compression of liquid by 15% of its volume. And this is where we generate the energy to do the things that you're doing with HPP, killing bacteria or whatever else you are applying HPP to do for you. At the end of the cycle, the water is recycled, product is taken out, and then you are ready for a, a next cycle. The system on the 525, we'll talk about later with a three-minute hold time for low-acid foods. For a high-acid product like an orange juice, the hold time in the vessel is about 60 seconds. The capacity of HPP has been increasing dramatically within the last five years, more so within the last three years. If we take a look at the curve, it's almost an exponential curve with the usage of HPP, and this data is through 2012. A viewer has been a leader in the technology by putting out equipment both on the vertical machines as well as the horizontal machines in order to satisfy the demands for a larger output of products. If you take a look at the, this is what, on the graph on the left hand side, it's show the different countries that have implemented HPP on a commercial basis, not for laboratory research. These countries, uh, the United States and the North America, basically are leading the way in the number of adoption, but we are seeing rapid growth in Asia, South America, as well as in Europe. The food categories in the United States primarily is ready-to-eat meats, but we are seeing a lot of the beverage industry growing worldwide. US has become not the leader in the beverage industry now, but it's catching up very, very quickly with some of these very high premium beverages. Seafood also is a major part of our industry. We don't talk much about it, but it's, it's primarily for 
yield improvement and for processing enhancement and not so much microbiology. So what are the market drivers to the beverage industry? Food safety, there are regulations from the FDA requiring that you have a five log pathogen reduction. Salmonella, Listeria, E. coli 157, as well as Cryptosporidium parvum. Those rules are being enforced a lot more strictly now by FDA because of this massive growth of the beverage industry. HPP meets those requirements. A viewer in 1999 submitted the petition to the FDA for the five log acceptance rule. And we have since done that with Health Canada as well as the European Union. Nutrition. There are no damage to your vitamins or sensitive bioactive components. So the product goes in, and I'll show you some data. It goes in, and the, the levels of, of your vitamins, whether it's vitamin C, niacin, folic acid, they all remain the same. Shelf life, microbiological shelf life is never an issue with beverages. The problem you have with shelf life is the, depends on the quality of your packaging material. You have to exclude oxygen. You have to, if you can have an, a UV barrier, those are the things that will affect your shelf life. And it's not a microbiological issue. One of the drivers of the technology is that people would like to have the raw, fresh taste that they will have in a fresh squeezed fruits. So when we're doing beverages, there are some very important parameters to consider. What the objective is, are you looking for a five log reduction, you're looking for a shelf life, or are you just trying to inact, um, inactivate yeast? Once those objectives are satisfied, we looked at the pH of the product, that determines what the processing conditions will be. Acidulants, whether it's a, a product with a higher concentration of citric acid versus malic acid, that also plays an important role in selecting what those processing conditions will be. The bricks, obviously, is very important because the water activity will decrease significantly as you increase the bricks. When that happens, we have to change the processing conditions. The product temperature, the packaging material, as I mentioned earlier, and the raw material and formulations. One of the growth in the industry currently is the mixture of vegetable juices with fruit-based juices. That actually changes the entire microbial flora of your product. And with that, you have to understand what those microbial flora, what the target is, what the shelf life you're looking at, and then tailor those conditions to give you your objective. But the formulation is very important. If you take a look at the pathogen inactivation study, I'm not going to go into too much data, but as you can see with inoculation studies in the dotted line, the product itself will reduce the levels of inoculation or your pathogens, but it will never exclude it. And the lines that are going parallel to the x-axis, to the y-axis, and at the uh, x-axis, you can see that the pathogens are destroyed and they do not recover. And these are the types of data that we have submitted to FDA earlier, as well as with some of the newer products to get acceptance for five log reduction processes for HPP. This is just a simple slide to simplify microbiology, not to go into too much data. E. coli 157 in the left-hand side is non-HPP processed. After HPP, you can see the absence of E. coli 157. This slide was just put to make the microbiology a little simpler to explain. Coconut water, we are having a lot of questions on coconut water from Thailand, the Philippines, Brazil, everybody wants to do coconut water now. The current way that they're doing it is that they're importing fresh juice, fresh coconut water from the Philippines or from Brazil and reprocess in the United States at a copac or a, co a toller operation. But you can get in excess of four months of microbiology stability of coconut water. One of the issues you do have with coconut water is that there are tremendous numbers of enzymes that need to be controlled. We can control most of it with exclusion of oxygen, but a lot of it 
needs to be controlled up front of the process. Most coconut water operations are very sort of farmer operated and the equipment they use are not conducive for water that is going to be stored over a period of time. So you have contamination with metal ions, you have oxygen exposure, and that will cause coconut water to get pink. But really speaking, coconut water doesn't have to be pink if you do the operation correctly up front before HPP. We tried coconut water frozen from Brazil on the left-hand side. We also bought fresh coconut out of Florida, and basically you're getting the same type of shelf life. The idea is, and I know a lot of people in here are interested in coconut water, the idea is to control the harvesting of the water from the coconut. And if you can do that in a very good, clean, well-controlled environment, you will have a stable product. HPP will not do anything other than killing the microorganisms in it. I mentioned the basically non-effect of HPP on, on nutritional components. Ascorbic acid on the yellow, we have uh, folic acid in the green and niacin in the blue. Before this product was introduced, HPP was introduced into Canada. Health Canada asked that we conduct this study to show that these components are not destroyed. And the study was done at Medallion Laboratory, which is a GM, um, General Mills Laboratory. And uh, that's the data, as you can see, no matter what pressure is used, you really don't change those nutrients. For products going to Japan, chlorophyll and lutein were considered very important. Uh, some types of beverages that are manufactured in the United States that are shipped into Japan, they want to make sure that chlorophyll and lutein are not affected by pressure. And those are the two insert slides at the bottom. The greens, um, we show that looking that you are increasing the chlorophyll comp uh, composition, but it isn't. All you're doing is releasing chlorophyll from the cells so that the detecting system that you have can detect more. The taste, raw juice, this is orange juice, raw juice have the same taste profile of HPP juice. Once you process it, there are parameters that started to show up. It's being more processed, more pity, rindy, as well as more bitter, as you would associate with heat treatment. So there is a rawness, or at least a close similarity of a raw juice to HPP juice. Examples of these products, you have three, three categories that are dominating the market now. You have fresh juice on the left. It could be a single juice or it can be a combination. You have a mixture in the middle, whether it's with a carrot or kale or acai berry, but the, again, the base is either a citric or an apple. And then the, the right here, you have what they call the cleanse formulations in which you have a very concentrated amount of vegetable juice inside of it. This is a new product that was launched in Brazil as of August 7th. It's in the market already, and this product here, they've already reached capacity because of the demand from the, the grocery stores, especially Walmart and Sam's Club in Brazil. This is a Starbucks product that we produce in, um, in Korea. It's being produced by Hong Kong out of Seoul, and it's being manufactured exclusively for Starbucks. You can buy this in any of the beverage stores or grocery stores in Korea currently. Other types of products, you have a lot of products that are being marketed now that is a juice or a pieces of apple that are in a puree either in cups. The one on the left, extreme left, is a product out of Portugal. They were the first company to do it. The one in the middle, the squeeze tubes, those are done in Montreal or in Franklin Center by Hilehi Orchards. And then you have several others. The one on the top right is in Italy. And the one in the middle is actually a nice application. They're being done in Holland right now. And it's almost like a health pack. They walk around with it. They could put it on cereal, on, on yogurt, as well as use it as a, an energy boost. All it is, 
is a puree of berry without any additives to it. We'll take a quick look at ready-to-eat meats and prepared foods. And the market drivers here have always been food safety because of regulations from USDA for uh, the reduction of listeria in these types of food, especially sliced meats. And as I mentioned, the meat industry is biggest in the United States for this category of food. The reason is there are USDA regulations for control of listeria in processing plants. But basically what they do, many companies would also like to protect their brands and also to prevent recalls. So food safety is paramount in the minds of in the eyes of the large food processors or meat processors in the US. And you may not know this, but almost, almost all of the sliced meats in the US are actually being HPP'd, even though it doesn't say that on the package. Most of these companies do not own their own system. What they do is they go to tolling services. We have tolling services uh, in, in uh, Nebraska, in in uh, Milwaukee, in California, several places in the US, I think there are eight tolling stations that are using a viewer's equipment and they just provide a service to the industry. Shelf life and quality extension, to me, in my view, this is what sells it to the industry. The quality of the product will last at least 90 to 120 days without any spoilage. You can buy now, I remember natural, uh, the, what, Hormel's product, that the natural choice product, you can buy it in the stores in Singapore. It has over 120 days of shelf life. Clean label. Almost everyone who is using HPP in the meat, as well as the meat, ready to eat meal industry, are not using preservatives. There are some companies that still have some levels of diacetate and lactate as natural bacteria sins but no one is using the potassium sorbates or benzoates, none of the chemical preservatives. And those that have natural bacterial sins are gradually taking it out because they don't want to surprise their customers with a difference in flavor. So most companies are working it out until there is none left into the product. Very quickly, this is a study in sliced roast beef. This is a commercial um, a company that is actually producing this currently. In the top, you will see the inoculated levels of Salmonella, Listeria, and E. coli 157. And in the bottom lines are the HPP treated samples. USDA is demanding now that you reach a five log reduction for Listeria monocytogenes in ready to eat meats now. It used to be a few years ago, well, if you show a two log and a three log reduction, the FDA, the USDA was satisfied with that. But new regs now, in fact, we're working on one this morning in Connecticut. The USDA is visiting one of our customers and they're insisting they see data for a five log reduction. So most of the earlier studies that were done showing two, three logs, you're gonna have to do inoculation studies that demonstrate a five log reduction. I don't like it because it's ridiculous that you have that number of listeria in your processing plant. If you do, you should not be in business. So five log is what the government wants to see. You just have to give them that. Shelf life, as I mentioned earlier, it's common for HPP sliced meats to get four months of shelf life. This is some, uh, I think this is a black forest ham, and it's over six months of shelf life. The lines at the bottom and then you have the control samples on the top. This is just a picture of a, a product in Canada. The left is the control and the right is the HPP product. And there are several of these. You have products from Romania, you have products from US, Greece, Cyprus, more and more companies in Europe because of the inconsistencies in the temperature distribution are using HPP to get the quality and the shelf life that they require to take it across. Most companies now, for instance, companies in Greece are starting to export into Romania. And companies from Romania are taking it across. I know that 
there are many companies in Romania that are using our system that are exporting this type of products into Russia. So it gives them a wider market to t sell their products and they're not restricted by short shelf life. There are meals that are being done. This is actually being done in California. Pasta in a, in, in a marinara sauce. Almost anything that doesn't have a lot of air inside and products that there may be some modifications of the formulation in order to suit HPP. Uh, you just can't take uh, a product and um, I remember Dr. Ito is at the back there, we were talking about this morning. You put a product in the HPP vessel, there are going to be changes and you have to know how to modify the product in order to make the, the technology works for you on the, the aesthetic side, not the microbiology side. You don't want to change how your products look for the customer. Condiments, there are many of these in the market. I could fit as many as I can on one slide. So we have salad dressings that are being done by Bolt House in California. You have a lot of avocado and guacamole. Most of you know the Avomex product that has been preached for many years. They're growing, but there are many other manufacturers. That product in the middle there is products that they're using a different base to make uh, wet salads. Like uh, one of the biggest drivers now is to use Greek yogurt in order to make it and get away from the mayonnaise-based uh, wet salad products. Hummus is a very large growth industry currently. In fact, hummus is really taking over the amount of salsas that were done by HPP. And hummus is an interesting product because it really fits into HPP. It has about 80% of carbohydrates and about 20% of protein. These two food components pick up a lot of moisture during HPP because there is an absorption into the molecule itself, the, the protein as well as the carbohydrate. It is one example, and I know you guys are from the food industry, you'd love to hear this. It is actually one example in which you can add more water to a product and it actually tastes better, a bit a better mouthfeel. And that's really what is driving the hummus industry. Raw protein. This has become important uh, because the price of beef has been increasing and there is a more trend towards eating poultry products, turkey or chicken. And there have been several large recalls. Uh, you could read it on, on, in, in the in the HACCP presses or food safety presses. And that has triggered some more regulations by F USDA on the control of salmonella, particularly in um, poultry products. There is also contracts that a lot of these companies have with their, with their buyers. They are supposed to supply them Listeria, salmonella or E. coli free products. So it's also being driven by the processors that they exclude these pathogens from these types of products. This has also been driven by the pet food industry. The pet food industry raw protein is under guidelines from, US, from the, I think, FDA, FDA, FDA currently for the absence of salmonella in their products. And that is a very large industry. I, I am surprised how much raw pet food is being sold to, the, to the, um, the pet food industry. But there are regulations that they need to be pathogen free because of cross contamination to the kids and to the adults, not to the animals that much. We did a, quite a few studies to demonstrate that it meets the requirement for USDA or FDA, whoever is controlling it, to show that you get a five log reduction. One of the things that you have with raw protein is that the protein goes through some denaturation issues when it's raw. And you want to minimize the changes by using the lowest possible pressure and time as well as controlling the temperature. That's the most important factor in, in looking at these raw products. It's not just pressure and time. You have to get the kill to satisfy the requirements, but you also have to preserve a product that is ultimately marketable. 
And I took the slides up because of time. There, there are quite a few products of raw poultry and raw chicken that are available in the market that is done through HPP. You will not know because it's not written on the package. They are using toll processors to do it. Most, uh, before I start this, most people have asked, why don't you do ground beef? Ground beef is difficult to do and because you have a lot of textual changes, color changes. There are ways to do ground beef by treating the raw material before the grind. And if you need some more information, we can supply that to you or you can visit us at our booth. We have currently a patent with, we're working, it's, it's actually pending with Hormel Foods on the tenderization of meat to increase the tenderness as well as increase the cook yield as well as the flavor. You can take a raw cut of meat, uh, a very cheap cut of meat, and give it the same texture profile as a filet mignon. You have to be able to understand what the conditions are. We are hoping that that patent will be granted within the next couple of weeks, and then we will be taking that out to our customers. We have just repeated the study, and it looks extreme, um, exceedingly well because we could replicate the earlier data. And we don't have a color change issues. On the right, there are two things to see on this picture. One, you don't have the drip loss associated with this type of meat after HPP because the, the moisture that you have, that fluid that comes out of a cut meat, is actually absorbed into the meat. HPP on the right and non-HPP on the left. And the reason why you're not seeing any color changes is because the pressures are not what we use for killing microorganisms. We can control the pressure, we can control the temperature, and the exposure time is very short. We're talking about 10 seconds and 15 seconds. So this is a tremendous application that has a tremendous interest in the industry currently. I'd like to spend the next two minutes to show you a new system that the viewer has put into the market as of yesterday. And that is the 525 liter, one of the, large, the largest HPP processing equipment. There have been three different improvements on these compared to other equipment a viewer or anyone else have made. We have redesigned what the intensification is. We have cut down on the maintenance by reducing the, the length of tubing that goes from the pumps to the vessel, as well as the major improvement is increasing the diameter of the baskets. If you do that, you can actually increase your load efficiency compared to a 350 liter. It's upwards of 90% efficiency loading compared to our 350. So just the physics of it. If you have a larger diameter of a, of a vessel, it will hold more product inside. If you lengthen it, you still have the restrictions of the smaller diameter. And this is just an animation of how the system works. I'll go through it as we, we, we look through. The entire system is enclosed in stainless steel. Baskets are loaded into the vessel. And one thing you can see here is that the intensifiers move with the closures. In previous um, installations, the, the intensifiers are separated and there's a lot of stress and strain on the tubings. High pressure, side, high pressure is generated into the system. We have three checks on the valid, validity of the pressure here, two pressure transducers, as well as an elongation analog on the frame itself. So you have three ways of testing that you reach your critical control point. After pressure, the water is recycled. This is a new um, design also. All the water is recaptured. So you're basically operating your vessel with a dry floor. If we compare this with the next largest system that is available commercially, which is a 420 liter, the increase because of the larger diameter is 
74% increase in loading efficiency of a larger diameter vessel. And this is where the answer is. You are increasing your diameter. Whenever you do that, you actually will increase the loading efficiency, whether it's a bottle, whether it's a vacuum pack, whether it's a, an MAP pack, it really doesn't matter. But you will gain more usable space in your HPP equipment. And I made it on time. Thank you. If you have any questions, we can address it real quickly. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, we do a lot of packages, MAP or Headspace. It really doesn't affect it. That has to do with there may be some issues with MAP, but we know how to control it. We can, we, we can control the decompression rate. Basically, what happens when you have an MAP package with a high nitrogen content, you're actually creating what we call the bends, the average disease, and that's very easily controlled. It's not a problem. We have been doing, we have quite a few customers that are using those packages. Oh, the question was, how do you, how do you deal with MAP packages with gas as well as larger headspace? I will do that. Yes. Yeah. That packaging is okay. Perfect. And, and, and that's actually a commercial product. Sorry. So what was the question again, Aaron? I'm sorry. Yeah. The question was, one of the slides was a, a tray of lasagna with a very simple heat seal film on top, and I was surprised that that withstood the HPP, but it does. It does. The only requirement we have there is that the sealing surface of the top film not to be one of the very skinny uh, one-eighth of a, you know, inch. Uh, we, we like it a little longer because it gives you a good co surface sealing without any rupture of the film. And that's being done in cups, in trays, and in almost any packaging material. But we like the lid, that, that lip, to be as wide as you can possibly get it. Not that you have to go and design a new bottle or a, a package, there is stock, uh, stock material available. Another question. She had a question. Mm -hmm. What about uh, using this technology, the HPP, with uh, glass packaging or uh, plastic uh, packaging? Any metal? Metals and glass don't work. Now, I hesitated before I say glass, because when the Japanese first introduced HPP products in the market, they introduced it in a glass bowl. It was a puree of pineapple and strawberries. And this was back in 1994 or something. But they had a very large lid on top and a total absence of any air, to talk about air spaces, because the film actually works as a diaphragm to transfer the pressure. Another thing is that the, that pressure was only, was an old Mitsubishi machine that was generating only about 4,000 bars maximum. Nobody's using 4,000 bars in those, in the commercial operation now. They go higher, the glass will not work. You will break the top film. Any other questions? Are you, find, oh, are, you, are, you, are you finding a, that in the meat industry and products that are using like the second skin packaging technology work, work better in this application? Yes, they do. They work better. Dave, there is one question at the back there. Okay. Here you go. Thank you. Is it require special type material for label or packaging? What happened to the packaging on this process? No paper material, that's the special. It's polyester film material is good for this? Actually, polyester film is very good. Works very well. Thank you. You're welcome. Another question? Hi. 
can you please repeat your recommendation for the coconut water and what is the best thing to do? It's going Thank to you. take a long time. You want to visit the center of our yeah. booth? We can spend some time with you with some coconut will, water buddy. questions. Come to our booth, please. Because we have some people waiting on the, on, the, on, the, on the room here. But if you really want the detail of it, you come to the booth. If you want a short part of it, control what you do up front before HPP. Exclude oxygen and exclude metal ions. Those are your problems with coconut water. But we can go into more And um, don't over-process with HPP. If you overprocess with HPP, you can actually promote enzyme activity. Any other questions? Thank you very much.